Skeptical questions should be answered by the Word of God. Skeptical questions should be answered by the Word of God. We've all been asked those questions concerning religion, Christianity, or even the Bible by skeptics. How can you believe that a man was swallowed by a fish? Come on. And then spit up onto the ocean. Reminds me of a little story uh, of a girl who was on a plane traveling to family's home alone. And she's sitting next to a intelligent businessman. And she's reading uh, the Bible there. And the man turns to her and says, do you really believe that? Because I don't believe it. I think it's a bunch of nonsense. And she says, well, yeah, I I believe it. He says, you believe that uh, a man was swallowed by a fish? And she says, yeah, it's written right here in the Bible. I believe that. He says, I don't believe that, just like I don't believe that there's a hell. And so she says, I'll tell you what, when I die and go to heaven, I'll ask God. And he says, okay, that's wonderful, do that. And he says, yeah, and when you die and you go to hell, you can ask Satan. He says, okay, I'll do that. So is it, is, it, is it true or is it not true? You know, the Word of God is a historical document. We know it to be a historical document when you read it from Genesis to Revelation. You find that there are historical places, that there are historical events that took place, and so there's evidence of historical accuracy. You also know that it is a spiritual document because it awakens the spirit in humanity. In fact, I believe that to be the strongest aspect of our testimony is how the Word of God has created us into new creatures in Christ Jesus. That it is alive and that it speaks to us and and it has power within it. If you were to to tell me that every other evidence was wrong and yet I had that evidence of, of reading it and my life changing because of it, I would still believe it because it has really taken a hold of my life. And then there is the the Word of God is a prophetic document, prophetic in that it speaks of future events. And it's accurate. In fact, every event that it said would happen has happened, 100% accuracy. And in fact, the Bible even makes this statement in Deuteronomy that if any prophet were to profess something in the future to happen and it doesn't happen, he says, they're not speaking for me. That is God. And they're a false prophet and don't believe in them. Now that's God making a claim and a statement that when I speak it, it will happen. I guarantee it 100%. And so it is a prophetic document. And these are all evidence for us so that we can believe that the word of God was written by God through men. And we need to really believe that. Uh, This morning's theme is counterclaim. If you remember last week, we left off at verse 4 where Peter says these scoffers, these mockers that make mockery said, for since the fathers fell asleep, now they call the Old Testament fathers, so they are believers in God or at least Jewish believers. As, as, As since the time that the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation, these scoffers said. And so these are the words of the scoffers. And so Peter here will recount two biblical historical events, the creation of the world and also the flood event. So basically what Peter is saying is, I will answer you mockers by the word of God. Since you referred to the day of creation, I will take you back to the day of creation and we will talk about God's word and what it said about creation and what it said about the flood as evidence that when God speaks, it's true and you can depend upon it. And so if God has said that there's a judgment coming and fire and brimstone is coming upon the world, then you should know that it's coming. And that's his whole purpose for explaining these two Um, events that took place and so we see the example of God's spoken word in verses 5 through 7 so let's go ahead and read those in context for this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water But the heavens and the earth which now exist 
are kept in store by the same word reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men or the destruction of ungodly men is the interpretation there. So again, here, he uses two examples. The first one of creation of the heavens and the earth that was spoken through God's word. And the second was a great global flood which destroyed mankind. Now notice in verse 5, he says, For this they willfully forget. Forget what? Well, these two events. The King James Version translates it, they willfully are ignorant of these two events. Well, they mention the event to Peter, that since the beginning of creation, so they have an understanding of creation of that event, and yet they're ignorant of those events. A couple of other translations I thought were interesting. One translation said they deliberately suppress. They deliberately suppress. Another one said they overlook. So you you get the idea that they were willfully ignorant, suppressing, and overlooking God's creation. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to think about it. Uh, You know, out of sight, out of mind type of situation. Uh, We do things like that. If someone comes to us and says, you know, the Bible says that you're a sinner. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about the bad things I've done because it makes me feel bad. (laughs) You know, and I don't want to think about all those things and those people that I've hurt and so forth. So just tell me how good I am. Tell me what a good person I am. Pat me on the back and those type of things. But don't tell me about that because out of sight, out of mind. I don't want to hear them. I want to be ignorant. I want to overlook them. I want to suppress those things because I don't want to deal with them. And that's basically what these Christians, if they are Christians, are doing. You know, when a Christian sins, he willfully suppresses the truth in order to enjoy the flesh. As believers, we do sin. And there are times where we fall into practicing sin. And in order to practice that sin, we have to suppress the fact that we're feeling guilty, that we're doing wrong, that we're disobeying God's, God's word. And so we become ignorant. And that's a, a process of hardening the heart. We don't really want to do that as Christians. We want to be open to the Holy Spirit and what he is ministering to us concerning our flesh and how it's sinful. And we have to deal with those things. We have to be um, truthful with those things because what comes, comes as a result of that is guilt and then condemnation. And then we have just a miserable walk with God. And so when we deal with sin immediately by confessing it and asking God to forgive us, God then begins to work in our life. That's the process of sanctification in our life. Jesus made a profound statement to Peter while they were in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was taken and arrested. And remember, he was praying and the disciples were supposed to be um, watching and praying. And so he came because they weren't watching and praying. And he said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. At least you enter into temptation because the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. Jesus knew that the flesh was weak. He understands our flesh and that we're weak people and we give in to the flesh a lot easier than it is to the spirit. And so he says you have to watch and pray least you enter into temptation. So how, to, how do we resist the flesh? We watch and we pray. We watch what we're doing, we watch what's going on around us, and we pray and seek God and ask for forgiveness. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a body of flesh. God created us into fleshly creatures. In fact, God became flesh and dwelt among us, but did he sin? No, Jesus never sinned, and yet he walked among us. The problem is is that when we allow these strong desires of temptation to come in and cause us to sin, whether it's anger, whether it's jealousy, whether it's selfishness, or, or any other type of sin, it is only through Jesus Christ that we can escape the consequences of this sin that we commit in the flesh. Paul told the Roman believers in Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put him on. In other words, have a desire to be like Christ. Yeah, we'll never be like Christ. I know that. And I'm not Christ. And you're not Christ. Yeah, we understand that. 
but we're to be like Christ. We're, we're to strive to live like him, to be holy as he was holy, to be kind as he was kind, to be merciful and, and so forth. We're to strive to do that. And so it should be a goal of ours that we write down on a piece of paper, a goal for 2014 or 15 is to be more like Christ. Help me, Lord, to grow that way. So we put him on. We put on that same spirit, that same desire. And then he says, make no provision for the flesh. Don't provide for the flesh. Don't give it opportunity to sin, to fulfill its desires and lust. Uh, stay out of the way of situations. If, if you're dealing with alcohol, don't go to the bar. Don't go around there thinking, I can get through this. No, you'll probably stumble and fall. Don't put yourself in those places if they cause you to sin. We must continue to struggle with the evil desires within ourselves. And we must separate ourselves from this evil world. That is sanctification. That's what all of us are doing at this time. We are struggling to battle against evil, against the flesh, against the world. This is a constant battle in our life. You know, I'm going to be 53. I know I look 22. (laughs) All right, I'm lying, 29. This coming November, that, to me that's old. And I know some of you here are a lot older than that and, and are wonderful and great people and say, you're just a baby. I, I understand my mom says that to me all the time. But to me it seems like it's an old, old, old place to be for me. It just does. You know, and I've seen so much in, in my life being in church probably. Well, by the way, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary this coming January in ministry here in Mariloma. 20 years in ministry. Praise God. Praise God. And we're, we're going to be having a celebration, so you're all invited uh, this coming January. But I've seen so much in those 20 years. I've seen people love and hate and uh, come in and support and then destroy. And I mean, I've seen so much, and it just seems in, in life, there's always evil in our life. I don't know of anybody who has not gone through some evil at all. Oh, I know there are a lot of people that can hide it very well and nobody knows about it. But if their families were open, we'd see a lot of problems and struggles, including my own. It's just life. We deal with evil. We deal with the flesh. For the longest time, I thought coming to Christ, everything would be perfect. What could go wrong now? Jesus is in my life. No, it doesn't work that way. Not at all. In fact, I can probably venture to say that you probably might have maybe a good week <laughs> before something evil comes into your week, you know, and then all of a sudden something happens, whether it's in your relationships or your children or a family member or, you know, a sibling or a parent, or a grandparent, or a cousin, something will come in. I just, I, I've seen it over and over and over again. So that is something that is constant, dealing with ourselves and dealing with evil that comes into our lives and the drama that comes along with it. Now here's my point of all of that, is what is important is the security of our salvation, eternal life. That is what's important. That is the constant, whether, whether you're young and you think that everything is okay and great and, and you're on the mountaintop and work and life is good, you're, you will struggle. You will struggle. But the thing that's important is eternal salvation. Do you have that security? Do you have that security age 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s? Are you still secure in Christ Jesus? That's the important thing. That justification. The sanctification, God is working in us. The world is constantly attacking us. It's constantly attacking the church. The church has evolved. I've seen it in these 20 years, evolved into allowing the world to come in and dictate how to how a church should be run. You know that pastors in the founding of this country had a lot of authority and weight in decisions in this country. In fact, a lot of uh our founding fathers were pastors, graduate of seminary schools and so forth. And today, because of our culture and trying to remove God from the schools back in the early, early what, uh, 
60s, 70s, right around there, get rid of prayer, get rid of the commandments recently, you know, remove God completely and, and, and turn it into a secular system, which it was a religious system in the beginning. They taught from the Bible, they taught scriptures, they, 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 they even had a pamphlet that was a regular uh, book that was used within the public school system. But it's all gone now. And so we've pushed the church out of society, and so now the church has no more authority. And in fact, they're dictating and telling the church how it should teach the Word of God. And it's sad because the world is pressuring us constantly. And that is constant. That is constant. But within all of that, what is important is our eternal security in Christ Jesus. Make sure that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, why is it that they suppressed the truth or were ignorant of What took place in the beginning? Well, it says in the next statement, by the word of God, the heavens were of old. In other words, God created the heavens and earth. Peter, again, is making his argument. Look, scoffers, you said judgment isn't coming because all things are the same from the beginning of creation. Well, let's go back to creation. It was by the word of God that the heavens existed. It was God's word that spoke it into existence. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Now why does it say by faith? Because we have to believe the Bible, which is telling us how the worlds were framed. Evolutionists have to believe the scientists, which are telling them how the world evolved, because no one was there at this time. We don't know anyone that was in the creational a time frame here, so we have to believe what the word account tells us. And no one was there when evolution started, so we have to believe what the scientist tells us. So it's all by faith. It's, it's religion. Whether you're a scientist and you believe in evolution, it's a religion. You have to believe it by faith. Or you believe what the Bible says because we know the Bible to be the word of God. And so by faith, we know that the worlds were created by the word of God. By the word of God. So we understand that by faith. Uh, Henry... Morris explained this concerning uh, the creation of the world. This is what he said. He's uh, uh, an apologetics. He's written many, many books, a lot smarter than I am, and has studied these things. He said, whether evolutionists, whether they are atheists, uh, pantheatic, in other words, they believe in many gods, deists or theists, or even evolutionists, they willingly ignore God's testimony. And that's what theme that's consistent with them they neglect the word of god they neglect god's testimony they don't believe the bible to be the word of god but they neglect and ignore god's testimony that the heavens and the earth uh did not evolve by continuing natural process but were called into existence by god's omnipotent word fully completely and functioning from the beginning and then he makes this next statement the only reason that god took as long as six natural days to finish his whole creation was to serve as a pattern for man's six-day work. God could have just created everything, boom, like that, and it would have been done. But he had a plan. And so he created it in stages. And those, those stages are for specific reasons. And we know the seventh day is a day that we rest. It's our Sabbath. It's our Sunday. It's a day that we come and we worship him and we support him and we get equipped for the work of the ministry to love God and learn how to love God. It's a day of rest. And so he created it as an example. That's why he took seven days. He goes on and says, there are now thousands of fully qualified scientists, some from every field of science who have studied the scientific evidence, pros and cons, who have come to the conviction that the biblical record of Earth's history is precisely correct and that evolutional theory is totally false. Thousands of scientists. Where are they? How come I haven't heard them on ABC and NBC? Because those stations are liberal and they suppress the truth. They don't want us to hear it, that's why. But they're out there, thousands. And if you were to study and to make an effort to find these people, you'll find them. You'll find them. They're there. So in order to accept Peter's statement here, we we need genuine faith in God's word, don't we? We have to believe what what Peter is saying here. Uh, Something that the scoffers lack. They, They didn't believe in the word of God. Oh, they believed in God. 
They believe he existed somehow in some way, but they did not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They didn't have an intimacy with God. And there are a lot of Christians like that today. They believe in God, and they can even go to church and even give, but they don't have a daily relationship with God. A relationship that costs them something. Because all relationships cost you something. You have to give up something to maintain that relationship. Unless you're so selfish and you're not willing to give anything up. So there's enough evidence here in scriptures to convict us that, that we have what Peter is talking about, that relationship with Jesus Christ. There's so much evidence on what it means to be born again and what it means to know Jesus Christ that we should be able to be convicted of that relationship. Let me ask you, if, if we were to take you to a court of law and gather up all the information about you, private and public, and we present it to the courts, do you think we would find you guilty of having a relationship with Jesus Christ or not guilty of having a relationship with Jesus Christ? I would hope we would find you guilty of having a relationship with Jesus Christ, that, that everything that you own and, and have done and viewed and are a part of would show evidence of you having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how you know if you know Jesus Christ personally. That's a good question to ask ourselves. Self-examination right there on is our walk with Christ good or I'm, am I just a worldly person wanting to indulge in worldly things. Your checkbook would say that. J. Vermeer would say that quite often. Show me your checkbook and I'll show you where your faith is at. <laughs> so true. Peter, Peter makes another qualifying statement here about creation. In the next statement he says, the earth standing out of water and in the water. Genesis 1-2 said the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. And so in the beginning, some, for some reason, somehow, everything that existed was, was in water. The earth was water. The, it talks about the firmament above and, and below was water. And so everything was, was water at that time. I found an interesting commentary by Mr. Wakefield. He said, a heaven and an earth formed out of water and by means of water, by the appointment of God, had continued from old times. And so that video this new finding here that they've been searching they knew that there had to be water in the crust they just didn't know where and, and how to prove that and so they've proven it there's a study that took place in an article that they wrote just from this past uh, june when they found this and it's called deep beneath the earth more water than all the oceans combined now he said there's enough water to cover the oceans three times what does that mean? That there'd be no land mass because three quarters of the world is ocean. It's only one quarter of it is land mass. So there's enough water in the crust to cover the whole earth three times. Three times. That's amazing. So that's evidence to the flood. For me, that's evidence for the flood right there. It's very clear. They, they found in a remote forest there in western Brazil this ugly rock, and he mentioned that that ringwoodite, it is a tiny green crystal and it has scars and bumps, at least what they thought were scars and bumps. It turned out to be that it was water within these crystals. And there's so much water in there that, um, again, they think that it would cover the earth three times. They found it uh, 325 miles uh, inside the earth's mantle. Apparently when lava uh, was coming up and volcanic uh, eruption and so forth, they get diamonds from there too they found this rock and they began to examine that rock from that uh, area so what they did was they put it put it under pressure and they simulated the same testing and they found that it was h2o and when you go that deep and under that much pressure like in an earthquake it crystallizes and so they were able to prove that scientifically and so again it's just interesting and what I love the most is what this man said uh, concerning um, this finding. Let me read it here to you. Stephen Jacobson of Northwest University 
said in a statement, I think we are finally seeing evidence for a whole earth water cycle, which may help explain, explain the vast amount of water on the earth. And so again, instead of, of admitting to the flood and that there's a possibility that the flood judgment was true, they just added the word cycle, another cycle in the evolutional theory itself. So again, by faith, you have to believe one or the other. And, and I believe in what the Bible says because there's more evidence there than anywhere else. <clears throat> so Peter gives evidence to this fact of creation which is contrary to evolution and also of the world flood. And he continues on in verse 6 concerning the world flood. He says, by which the world, the cosmos, uh, that word cosmos is referring to an orderly arrangement. It's where we get our English word cosmetics. And so like in cosmetics, you know, women will put down a foundation and then they'll put the blush and then they'll put, I don't know after that, the, and they, in an orderly fashion and then boom, they're beautiful. You know, they're beautiful. And so in an orderly fashion, God created everything, the cosmos. Uh, what he said here is that then existed perish, being flooded with water. Now, he spoke these things into existence. It was through his word. And so we find that Genesis account there in biblical history that men were scoffing in those days. You remember the story of Noah and that God told him to build an ark. Right? And there were men scoffing, what are you doing? Why are you building our, just like today? Oh yeah, Christians, God, God's going to judge the world. Yeah, we're coming to an end. They make movies, they, you know, they laugh, they, they put men with signs on there, the end of the world, and you know, laugh at it and so forth. Same thing's happening today, just like the days of Noah. What I find interesting is that God somehow built into this whole water thing uh, um, the means to destroy the world. By the earth sucking up this water from the beginning, if, if the whole earth was water, firmament above and below, if it was all water, and then he began the, to bring the land mass you know, about, he sucked the water into the core and crystallized it. And so then at that time, then man existed, they sinned continually, and it says every thought and imagine was so corrupt in their minds that God finally had to judge them again. And so then we hear of the rain and the moisture and then the waters and then probably from underneath too, the water's coming up, flooding the whole earth. And so within his creation, he, he created the means to destroy also. He's in perfect control of everything. He knows past, present, and future. And so he's also created within the means of this world the process of destruction by fire. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Now we know that he promised that he would never flood the earth again, right? In the Genesis account. So that will never happen again, the flood. That's a promise and that's why we have the rainbow to remind us that God's saying, nope, I made a covenant with the children of Israel not to flood it, but I am in control. On Wednesday we were studying Jeremiah chapter 5 and it was interesting. Uh, in, in chapter 522, uh, God said, uh, do not fear me or you do not fear me, says the Lord. Will you not tremble at my presence? Have you, who has placed the sand as a bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it and thought its waves tossed to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. What God was saying to Jeremiah is let my people know who's the one that stops the water where it's at. Right where the sand is. Even though the waves crash and roar, who keeps the water from coming on the land? I do. And, and if I do, then why don't you fear me? Why don't you have a personal relationship with me? God is in total control. You know, it's his perfect timing. And he released it at his perfect timing. <clears throat> There are some secular sources, and we know this, we've all heard the sources, and, and there's a lot more than what I have here, uh, stories of ancient tribes and so forth that speak of floods happening uh, during their history. And so again, just the evidence, because what Peter's doing here is he's saying the flood was a historical event. It did happen. 
So the Bible is qualifying the Bible. And he's saying what God said back then took place. And so if creation took place, how God spoke it into existence, and if the flood took place, then guess what? Judgment's coming. Because God said it's coming. So he's basically making that point to them. So now his point, the final day of judgment, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition or destruction of ungodly men. So the earth today and even today right now, the only thing that's preserving it is God. By the word of God. So just as God spoke it into existence, the world, spoke the flood to come, and and the world today and how it's being held together, it's from God, word that holds it together. He says in um, Colossians 1.16, he is before all things, that is Jesus Christ, before all things, and in him all things consist or are held together. In him all things consist are held together. Hebrews 1.3 says, and upholding all things by the word of his power. So God holds all things together completely. It's interesting, I was reading an article on matter. You know what matter is. We all went to school, and we know that everything is made up of matter, right? This, this is made up of matter. This is made up of matter. Paper's made up of matter. We're made up of matter. And matter is just held together, right? By You have the, the protons, neutrons, atoms, and all of those things that hold us together. God has built in, within that system, the means of fire destruction. Think of the splitting of the atom. What has it done? created a great weapon, hasn't it? Now, take that and multiply it in the whole world. How is God going to destroy this world? Somehow splitting that matter, and boom, everything's destroyed at once. So within that system, God has designed the fiery judgment that will come upon the earth. Now, scientists started looking into that, because that's the question, right? Scientists are really religious men trying to answer their questions. You know, why do we exist? Why do things happen? Why does the world held together? Who holds it together is really the question. And they found that these atoms are held together by the neutrons, you know, the, the positive and negative attractions and so forth. And so they started playing around with them as, as they would, you know, discovered the atom bomb and trying to, to get them to go off course in a sense because they're usually straight lines as they run. And they can get them to wave depending on temperature. So they try to heat them up. Nothing happened. They still held together. Then they th- tried to freeze them and to see what happened. And they went below zero. And anything below zero is zero. So they went as low as like minus 600 degrees. It's still zero. And nothing, it, it slowed them down a little bit, but they were still held together. So their conclusion to all of that was, what's holding them together? Well, Jesus is. He's holding everything together. So if God holds matter together, he can hold our lives together. He can take care of us. He can watch over us. He can heal us. He can mend us. He can restore us. Because that's the God that we serve if we believe that he's able to do those things. So Peter's point here is is that God created everything, the heavens and the earth, and he preserved it by the same word that created it. He preserved it to this day until the fiery day of judgment comes to destroy what? The ungodly men, those men that do not believe in Jesus Christ. And so again, I ask you, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Let me close. Because it's a sad thing today to hear of Christians become mockers and scoffers of the word of God. You know, there are a group of Christians that don't believe in the creation of this world. They believe in evolution. And they call themselves Christians And they've allowed the culture to dictate what they believe. And so you have people saying the creation, the flood, those are myths. Those are just stories that are told in the Old Testament. They're not true. We know that scientifically we evolved. And these are Christian churches that believe this. We have musicians, and I shared with you several months ago, a musician who came out and said the the creation, the flood story, it's all myth. It's not real. Come on. Well, Jesus referred to it. Peter referred to it. They're both saying they're historical events. 
How do you answer that? You know how the musician answered it? Well, they understood that the people were naive and they wouldn't really believe the truth, so they just kind of says, yeah, that's, you know, back like that in those days. Really? These were scholars who went to Greek schools. Paul was the smartest man ever. You know, they said that they could not keep away books from him because he was so learned. You know, I mean, they just, how can they say that? They weren't there. No, why do they say it? Because they're just like these people. They want to live in sin. They want to live in sin. They want to have the opportunity to continue on the way that they're living and the lifestyle that they have. That's why. And so these Christians, they become like the scoffers. And it's so sad that they don't believe in the creation or believe in the word because it's essential that we believe in the creation. It's essential that we believe in the flood of God because it tells us that God is sovereign, that he is sovereign, that his will will be done. And so Peter was right on both those counts concerning creation, concerning the flood. So he is also right concerning the judgment that's coming upon the world. Do you want to be judged or do you want to escape the judgment of God? That's the question. Because God will judge you and judgment is there already. John chapter 3 says that you are condemned already. That unless you believe in Jesus Christ and you are born again, you will not have eternal life. Now if you want to skip judgment, escape judgment, then it's simply by believing in Jesus Christ. You remember the disciples? came to Jesus and they said, Lord, what can we do? What can we do to have eternal life? You remember that question? A profound question. And then Jesus said what? Believe in the Son of Man. Well, that is an interesting answer. What was he saying there? What were they asking? See, we are so geared to works and religion, we think there's something we can do to have eternal life. There isn't anything we can do. And so what they were saying, Lord, what can we do to have eternal life? Let us do something. Is there a religious, you know, uh, ritual? A sacrament? Were the Jews wrong? A commandment maybe, Lord? What is it? Should we just come and wash your feet? Should, what, what should we do, Lord? And Jesus just said, nothing. You do nothing but believe in me. That's it. Is that true? Yes, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with Jesus. He died on the cross for us. He took our place. He did it all. Took the penalty of sin upon him so that we could have eternal life. And so we can do nothing. And so when Jesus said that to them, they were blown away. Well, wait a minute. Do nothing? That doesn't make any sense. And then at another point, remember Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that or is more than the religious leaders, you will not enter the kingdom of God. That blew them away too. Like, what what do you mean there? What are you talking about? At one point you're saying we don't have to do anything. Now you're saying that our righteousness has to be greater than the religious leaders? Again, our mindset is on works. What Jesus was saying is it's impossible for you to be righteous because there is no righteousness you can obtain. Nothing. Nothing. And then he says, I am your righteousness. And so the only way to become more righteous than religious leaders is to believe in Jesus Christ and he imputes into us that righteousness. That righteousness. If, if somebody passes away and they have a million dollars and they put it into your account, they've given it to you and put it into your account, guess what? You're a millionaire. Because they put it into your account. That's imputing it to your account. You never worked for it. You never expected it. All of a sudden it was there. And people are saying, you're a millionaire. I "I don't feel like a millionaire. I'm still the same person. What are you talking about? There's a million dollars in your account. That's what Jesus has done. He has imputed to us into our account his righteousness. And so we are righteous because it's in our account that he has done it for us already. And so it's just if we believe... And it's his righteousness. It's nothing to do with us. I hope that makes sense. It's not about you. It's about his work completely. And all we have to do is believe it. And once we believe it then, we begin to seek him and love him and get to know him. And then we're not asking, what can we do to, in- to inherit eternal life? We're saying, Lord, what can we do to please you? 
How can my life change so I can better myself and glorify you in my life? That's what it's about. That's the sanctification. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. Come to know him today. Let's pray.